this is something that has the exponential factor to it. This is, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars now. Putting in your time, not getting paid, just keeping your head down, believing, 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 creating your future, and then bang, this happens. And I want to encourage everybody to do this. You just have to understand how it works and be patient. Hi, and welcome to the Micro Empires podcast, where we learn how to build small empires for wealth and security, because you don't have to be wealthy to build wealth. I'm Jennifer Grimson. I'm your host. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome back. Today, my guest is Mike Searock Sirocco, and he's the co-founder of Blueprinted, a best-selling author of a book called Rocket Fuel, and a powerhouse behind a movement called What Are You Made Of? Mike's story starts out as a young kid and you'll hear about it, but basically he made the choice to take the things that most of us would see as setbacks and use them as fuel instead of baggage. So instead of putting it in his trunk, he said he put it in his fuel tank and that has evolved into rocket fuel, which is what he is doing now as a performance coach, an author, public speaker, and a thought leader. He's also had several other businesses <laughs> and he's uh, building a technology platform basically right now. So you're going to hear about Mike and his life. And he's just been a really interesting person to get to know. We talk about the fact that we never would have met had it not been for podcasting and probably COVID. So I hope you enjoy this and let me know what you think. Thank you so much for being here, Mike Searock. I'm thrilled to have you here. And I appreciate you having me on your show, which I think is coming out pretty soon, actually. Hopefully it'll probably come out before this one comes out. And I know we overlapped on social media and what brought us together, but I know you work with people all the time and, and you start out with what are you made of? I start out with, because my show is about money, mostly money and, and how to build wealth, no matter where you are. I start out with your money culture growing up, how you grew up, what you were taught about money. And how that affected you as you headed out into the world to make your way? Well, so I have came from a broken home, first of all. I don't remember my parents together. My mom, she always had like a salary job and she would always be paycheck to paycheck. And my dad had a business, a masonry business, and he did well. And but he was known to be tight that, you know, so much that he would make George Washington yell, holding on to a dollar. Like that's just the way he was. And you know, it's kind of funny because the story that I usually tell, I lived with my mom until I was eight. I did the every other weekend thing. I went to my dad's every other weekend and I would end up at my grandparents' house because my dad was always working when the weather was nice. And after I got to about eight, my mom was moving on to her third marriage. And I was just like, I'm not moving into another man's house and learning another man's rules. Let me try my dad's house. And I did that and found out later my broke my mom's heart. She said she used to cry herself to sleep at night. She didn't tell me at that time. She just let me go. But, you know, and I, I don't know uh, what that's done to our relationship overall, what it would have been like differently. We, you know, we have a pretty good relationship. We don't see each other that often. But nonetheless, I moved to my dad's. He was on to a second marriage with my stepmom. And long story short, that stint with my dad for three years, I dealt with a lot of abuse. There was a conflict going on with my parents, my step parents, my stepmom. And my stepmom took it out on us a lot. And, you know, I dealt with abuse, like verbal, mental. And, you know, my dad would always do this thing when they would be arguing or she'd going off like behind her back and thumbs up, winking at me, like, just let it ride it out, you know, just. And so after a while, it just started to be a situation where I was tired of it. I would sleep with my baseball bat when I was nine years old. Oh my gosh. That I would see and hear. And, you know, after a while, I was just like, dude, I, there's got to be a better way. Right. right. And so I, I shared with my mom what happened. And long story short, she filed court papers to get me out. And my dad eventually, after weeks went by, had him delivered. And when he found out and he, and he, and he came back in, into my room and confirmed that this was the case, my dad, my hero, used to carry a wad of $100 bills in his pocket instead of a wallet. That's what Italian guys do, most, most of them, <laughs> and uh, with a rubber band around it. Right. And I used to look up to him for this because it was just so cool how hard of a work he was. I saw the money. And you know, the only thing really, as far as lessons go, I'll finish that story in a second, but lessons go, I just remember my dad telling me that you should save half your money. He didn't right. tell me to invest it. He didn't tell me what, what to do with it. He just said, save it. He was more of a hoarder rather than an investor. Right. 
And I never saw cash flow except for working. That's where you got your money is working. So I didn't really know about cash flow or passive income, so to speak. So, but when he confirmed that I wanted to leave with my mom and talking about money here, he goes, okay. And he takes that wad of hundred dollar bills out that he always carried with him. He peeled one off, crumpled it up and threw it at me and said, well, here, you're going to need this then when you're living on the streets with your mother one day. Oh my God. And you know, he put it in my face that my mom didn't have money and didn't do well with money and had men coming in and out and all this other stuff. Right. So that's the kind of lessons that I got. That's that's basically what I saw. My mom was always like, you know, if we, you know, she didn't really say we can't afford it a lot. She would just get it. And then we wouldn't have any money until the next paycheck. Right. And we would go on vacations to the Jersey shore, luckily to an old motel. There'd be six of us mm-hmm. in one room and we'd have black trash bags as our suitcase. Like right. it was, you know, that kind of stuff. So You know, growing up, I guess I got the mix between the both of them. I got the mix of, hey, you need to save some money and go get money, but don't be, don't be afraid to spend it and, 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 you know, live your life in a way. So, but what I've learned recently though, Jennifer, is that I want to take my money and invest it in things. But right now I'm in the stage where it's investing in me and my businesses and that's Mm -hmm. it. Like, I'm not worried about cash flow and properties and passive income right now. I'm, I'm worried about not worried really. I'm I'm focused on just hammering away the business and investing in myself so that this this flow of income comes in from all these sources and I can just shovel it into those passive income opportunities. Right, right. And we'll talk about the business a little bit, but I think just that image of an 11-year-old boy and a father taking a dollar bill of any size and crumpling it. I mean, that is such a it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. I think I, I think I'd take a punch in the face over that. I've done, I've done, hey, I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> How did that affect your relationship with your dad? I mean, I'm sure at 11, you couldn't have understood all that that might've meant or represented, but. Well, I think that looking back, I mean, I, and I think I knew it at that time too, that he was kind of blindsided and he maybe just was in denial of what was going on and he felt hurt. Yeah. But I also know that my dad valued money over a lot of things. And right. so what it was going through his head, there was always a child support battle, you know? Mm-hmm. But I thought when that happened, right? When it happened, I'm like, oh no, what did I do? that kind of yeah. thing. And then very shortly after that, it was like, I ain't going to need that money. Yeah. Like, I'll show you. I was already selling golf balls on the golf course for money when I was eight. So I I, I was like, I will get money. So then I, I used that spark. Like that's a spark that lit for me at a young age that I was just always like, nope, when things got tough. I ain't stopping. I'm going to get, I got to, I got to make sure I don't prove him right. And when things got easy or things were going great to take it to the next level, what am I going to do with that? Like, I got to go, I got to keep going higher. Right. Yeah. I drove off that for 30 some years until my engine was refined. I use that as fuel. I call it my rocket fuel, right? Stored right. in my tank instead of my trunk. Mm-hmm. And your trunk is where it weighs you down where most people keep it. I was storing in my tank and converting constantly. But the problem though, Jennifer, is that when you get to be a refined engine, like I am now, mm-hmm. if, I, if I may say so, <laughs> you cannot use that toxic low octane fuel anymore because it leaves a residue and right. it encases you and limits you and holds you back. So you need a higher octane fuel. And that higher octane fuel for me now is my dreams and my goals that I'm able to clearly vision. Right. I'm able to clearly create a future and cause a future for myself and others. And that's my new oct- high octane fuel for my higher octane engine, right. so to speak. I think it's so interesting that from the time, you know, you just told the story just between the ages of eight and 11, but basically that is the launching pad uh, even before that, because you were selling golf balls at eight where you made a decision that you were going to turn this into fuel. And I love that imagery of you can either put this in your gas tank or you can put it in the trunk. And, you know, your gas tank actually makes you go forward. The trunk is what, if that's all the baggage we talk about all the time. So that happened really young, but we got a long way to go between <laughs> that happening and where you are today. So tell me about your journey, I guess, financially, kind of the roads that you took, were you always going to be a business owner? Were you a W-2 guy at any time? What were the real like light switches that went on? I mean, that was clearly a lesson and you had that ingrained in you as a kid that you're just going to keep up and keep going, which is an incredible skill. But what else has it been along the way? So my grandfather had his own business as well. Besides my dad, my grandfather on my dad's side was a mushroom farmer. And what that is, is that just like mushrooms that you eat in salads and on steaks and things, Yeah, they had these mushroom houses. They're cinder block on concrete, different levels, dark, musty. They used to wear helmets with flashlights on the, the helmet. And he, they, he owned a mushroom company. Mm-hmm. And, and, and he worked with 
don't know if I'm allowed to cuss, but like horse yeah, crap, you can. <laughs> horse shit. And he worked in shit all day. It was a shitty job. Like that, that's what he did though. And that was his business. So I saw that. I saw my other, my mom's grandfather. He had a stucco masonry business as well. I saw that. I worked with him. I saw all that. And I saw that I don't really want to work for a company, but in school, in high school and in college, they were talking about, you got to work for a company, get the benefits, get the, you know, the pension and all this. And then, so I had these conflicting things. So I went to college with an idea that I wanted to be a sports broadcaster and I wanted to study business as well. And I made it through just about three years of college with a 4.0 and then I dropped out. And I just, I saw the movie Cocktail um, and I thought, man, what, how awesome would it be to get into the restaurant business and then go open up a business in the, in the Caribbean or something, you know? Wow. <laughs> you know, you see these things and you're like, man, I would like to be like that. So I did, I went to the restaurant business and of course, then you're still, you know, working, but I needed to learn that business, right? But I quickly saw that when I got into that, that I got off track because I was hanging out with people I probably shouldn't have been hanging out with. Alcohol was involved big time and then drugs because after the bar, we were done working, we would go to a house party or something. And then how do you stay up that late? Well, you would do cocaine or, you know, smoke marijuana to go to sleep. And, and it was just, uh, I fell off track for a while. And during that time, I got to get out of it kind of, I, I was transitioning into a place where I got into sales. I met a guy that came into my restaurant a lot. He was a great guy, great influence. And I started working for him in in-home sales. And I did that for nine years. What, cut, what, were, you, what were you selling? Um, we were selling water treatment systems. Okay. So I would go into houses and, and do a presentation, test water for people, show them if they had this kind of system and what the water would look like. If their water, you know, we didn't do anything unethical, but if there was a problem, we would use a cleaner softener and all these right. other filters. Right. And uh, I did it for nine years. And I don't like looking back, I'm just like blown away that I just, I, I was still partying and I wasn't focused. And until I met my wife and I was committed to, to that relationship and building a family, that's when I changed. And I went back to where I was when I was a kid. Cause I never drank until I was 18. Wow. And got out of high school and mm -hmm. I was focused and I just lost my way for a while. So from there, I started thinking to myself, okay, I'm in sales. I can make a lot of money in sales. I don't need to own a company right now. And then I got into the mortgage business when I got straightened out and I didn't go to rehab or anything like that. I didn't, mm -hmm. I just got recommitted again, like yeah. recommit, you know, and had a purpose. So I went into the mortgage business, started as a loan officer and real estate. I had a real estate license and then I just took off. Great. And so that's, that's where it started before I got into like kind of owning the business. So, mm -hmm. and then we've written a book, but you've made a shift. So tell me about what you do, what you're doing now. So back in 2011, my partner, Chris and I, who's one of my best friends from when I was little said, you know, why are we just doing this little thing here? We're playing too small. Let's go open branches, mortgage branches, instead of just being loan officers. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I just want to grow. And so we did. And the owner of the company that we talked to, who ended up screwing us over later on said, you ain't going to make it. Like, I, I, I don't see that you're going to make it, but if I don't say yes, you're going to go to somebody else and they're going to put you in this position. So, and he let us go, but we ended up building this big 40 person team and seven branches and wow. making millions of dollars. And we did well, but back in 2017, and, and I just, I wasn't picking the right people to work with. We were making money, but it was just, you know, a lot of problems, a lot of headaches, like just people that were causing problems and so right. I, I said to myself, you know what? There's got to be a bigger game to play. Like, I don't think I'm giving my potential like a chance here. And I started thinking, I got to sp start speaking. I got to yeah. start speaking and, and getting out there and getting known. And so in 2017, I got on this mission of uh, how do I do this? How do I figure this out? And that's when this mission that I'm on now started. And it just has taken off, you know, what we're 2021, right? So yeah. it's like four years now since I just mm -hmm. decided to. Mm -hmm. It's rocket fuel trajectory, rocket ship trajectories, like straight up now. And then I got into writing a book, podcast. I started meeting people that I would not have normally met without the podcast, as you know how this works. Yes. And then I just started meeting people that were getting, like, giving me games to play, like bigger games. And yeah. tech came about. Mm -hmm. And I decided to get into the tech industry, which we're leaning into hard now. And now I found my home. Oh, wow. Yeah. I remember we talked about a little bit about that. That's amazing. Are you thinking about starting a podcast? Well, you should. 
And if you do, you should call up my friends at Streamline Podcasts because they do all the backend work in one stop shop. Honestly, it is one of the hardest things about trying to get something like this off the ground. It's all the editing and the socials and the cool images and all of the other things that they do over at Streamline Podcasts. And the best part is it's all at one price. It's all delivered to me really, really quickly. And it's I couldn't possibly put it together for the amount and the speed that they do. So I can't recommend them enough. Now, if you want to go to stream my podcast and you link in the show notes to my promo code, you will get a discount. So I encourage you to go there, check it out, use my code, please. And you'll get a discount on your first month. So I look forward to it and I hope you join me in the podcast world you start out going, I just got to speak about this. And then it grows into this whole other thing. Are you completely out of mortgage loans, all of that altogether? No. no. So we still have uh, 30 employees and I have a, my, my three of my best friends, my little brother and this other lady named Beverly run the company day to day. I get into involved maybe an hour or so a day. Yeah. And it's going great. Finally got it dialed in where we got the right people, like good people that like are aligned with our mission. Right. We were just doing things wrong in the past as far as like no core values, no systems and processes. We were just grind and go. Right. Right. So now we have that, but so that's still running. Absolutely. But now it's a situation where you, 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 there's a, there's a story in the Bible and it, there's also a movie. If you don't read the Bible, there's a movie about Noah's Ark mm-hmm. and this, this Steve Carell was Noah. And the story basically goes where Noah got this inclination or this word from God, depending on what you believe. Right. That he needs to build this ark. And this ark would take a hundred years to build because it's so massive. Right. right. And back in the day, they didn't have the technology and, and the tools, but and get two animals, male, female, bring them right. on the ship, all this stuff. We all know how the story goes. But he didn't know why. And right. in the middle of the desert where there's no water. And he just kept following that voice, that mm-hmm. God's voice, inclination, whatever, intuition. And people laughed at him, they discouraged him. But he Mm -hmm. kept his head down and kept doing it anyway. Right. And at the end of the day, we know the story. Well, rain came 40 40 days and 40 nights of rain in a place that doesn't get rain. It flooded. They survived. And whether you think that's a real story or not, this is how, and I'm not relating myself to Noah by any means, but (laughs) but this is how this worked for me. Like I was, I I was going through this thing where something was telling me that I need to do this. I need to do these things, speak, podcast, write a book, start meeting people. And all of a sudden, now, by the way, I dealt with ridicule. I dealt with discouragement, sometimes even from the closest people closest to me. Yep. But I am inexorable, which means unable to be stopped and unyielding when I get onto something. And I just use all that as fuel. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I f- it became clear. Like I see all this now. It's like it all unfolded. I'm like, oh, this is why I did all that. And it yeah. all lines up. And I'm now prepared to s- just absolutely crush this new venture and right. impact so many people. Right. It's um there's so much there. And that's so interesting to me because I had the same epiphany. I mean, starting the podcast was a lot about, I, I, I left my corporate job and I didn't know what I was going to do, et cetera. And I never thought I was going to make, you know, my money off of podcasting. What I thought was I'm going to just record this because I'm doing it anyway. And everybody should understand what it took and, you know, kind of come out of the closet about my own story. But definitely a lot of the steps I'm making, I'm kind of like, I don't really know necessarily where this is all going to lead, but I do know it's the next thing that I need to do. And I do know that, that the message is resonating and I do know that people are being affected. And so I think that's kind of it. I mean, I have other skills that allow me to make money and everything will lead there, but it has for me, I mean, just this show alone has introduced me to people that I, I never would have met you. I never, ever would have met you had it not been for this podcast. But the ridicule thing is hilarious. I had a family member say to me the other day, so what's your goal now? You just want to be like a super famous celebrity podcaster? And I was like, are you are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's my goal. That's what I'm doing. Clearly, don't listen to the show. So, you know, I just, I think there's a lot to be said for that. But I also want to focus on and not take away for the fact that you built a really big business that produced a lot of money and you became focused. You found your wife, you found your family, all of that. You built this business and you're doing this other venture. But sometimes, especially in social media, people, all they hear is, 
Well, C Rock did it. He just he just jumped, man, with nothing and started this whole movement. But you didn't. You had a whole, you have a whole foundation, a business that keeps you and you, your family and everything afloat. And yeah, you're doing yeah, yeah. this other thing. I just think that's really important because a lot of people are they think, oh, I'm gonna quit my job and do do what he did. Yeah, no, no. Well, you still gotta figure well, out how to pay the bills. <laughs> absolutely. Not only just pay the bills, but like our mortgage side of things and my partners and I do everything together. Like they're, they're doing the the day-to-day operation. I'm going out to make big moves for us so that the game that we're going to play is so much bigger, but they're taking care of this now and they come with me. So we're investing money together into the podcast, into the social media, into um, the book. I mean, we spent, we spent like, I got Grant Cardone wrote the forward for my book. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't just do that kind of stuff. He doesn't, he's no, never written a full. He doesn't, right. And I paid 75 grand for that. Mm-hmm. I didn't. We all got together, invested in that because we saw the possibilities. And now we are partners in a tech company with Grant. We wouldn't have had that if we didn't do that move. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what would come. That's another Noah thing, right? I didn't know what would come from that. I knew I wasn't going to sell enough books to make up for that. It just wasn't not for a first time author. And I don't, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I still made a bestseller list, but I knew I wasn't, the return on investment wasn't directly from book sales. It's down the road somehow. I had no idea. It wasn't clear at that time, but I just kept pursuing and that's what happens. But yes, you have to have, like, people don't realize I have a team. I have money going out every month that pumps into this, but it's because I was so focused and dedicated since 2006 in the mortgage industry. So what is that? Six years until 2019 is when I started the podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's 13 years I put into building something, my main flow, so to speak. Right. And before I got a team up and running that could run the day to day and I can make my money and we can invest into this stuff. I mean, that takes a long time and some people aren't patient enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I don't think a lot of people highlight it that way because that's not as sexy as, hey, I just quit everything and started this and overnight I'm a millionaire and it's amazing how that all worked out. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about your book, what, what it is, what brought it on for you and sure. how it's changed things for you. Because I think it I think it really has. I think, I think you and I first met just before it had come out. Yeah, so I marketed the hell out of this book ahead of time. You know, Grant always talks about putting a landing page up before you do anything and then just market the landing page and see how it goes. And so I did that and I sold a lot of copies before it even went out. And the artwork, you can sell a book by its cover. You may not be able to judge a book by its cover, but you can sell a book by its cover. And my friend, the pitch freak, Antonio White did the cover. I think it's uh stands out, it's phenomenal. And then Grant being on the cover with his reputation helps the credibility of it. So immediately inside the organization where I'm definitely present and I made sure I'm, I'm, I show up to everything in the 10X world, that gave me a big boost because they're, they're the type of people that will support anything if you're involved with it and you're supportive of it and you're giving all the time. And But there's messages in here. I've gotten stories from across the world. It just blows me away, the podcast and in the book that people reach out and are just blown away by some of the stories and how it impacted them. And it, it, it gives me the confidence I need to keep going. You know, like I, I want to make impact. So yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's definitely made a big difference. And again, that being crazy enough to wire $75,000 over the Cardones and then them thinking, oh gosh, this guy's either crazy, crazy good, right. or he just knows what he's doing. Or he's and a really, genius. I think it's, I think it, I'm crazy good. Like yeah. not, not, not crazy good. The good kind of crazy. I don't want to make sure uh, I, say I, think, right. I think it's crazy good. I think that is crazy good. That's like when you so, eat something, you're like, that's so good. It's crazy good. Yeah. And so when I when I when I go to them and want to set up a meeting with my tech co-founder, they know that it's me wanting to give. Like I've given. You know, right. it's not something I'm just trying to get something out of them. Right. And so that opens doors, man. I mean, I I look at this and I look back at all the decisions that I've made over these. I'm sure I've made mistakes, but I had a good, kind heart and genuine, and I wanted to give and be a part of something like lifting others up. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, it may not feel like it's paying off immediately, even over time. You feel like, man, but man, let me tell you something. Well, here's an example, Jennifer. So I've done some coaching. I've gotten paid for coaching, but like the time and money that we're investing and effort, and I'm not getting paid for that. Right. Right now. Right. But now with the tech thing that we're doing, now we're talking about not getting into a situation where you're getting consistent money and it's good money and this and that. This is not like that. This is something that has the exponential factor to it. This is, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars now. Right. Right. Putting in your time, not getting paid, just keeping your head down, believing, 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 creating your future. And then bang, this happens. And I want to encourage everybody to do this. You just have to understand how it works and be patient. 
You know, I think because the show is about money and how to grow wealth, right? So everybody who listens, I want them to be able to, from every episode, to take away something. So if, if, if I'm driving to my job right now and I'm listening to this interview and I'm thinking, okay, great, well, he's creating a some technology and it's hundreds of millions of dollars. What does that have to do with me? Nothing. It has nothing to do with me. But the truth is, and I, and I think we talked about this the last time we talked, that I, I really encourage people to always keep your mind and your opportunities open for growing wealth. So do I need to go out and discover a technology, et cetera? No, but do I need to stay apprised of people like you or other people who are doing such a thing? And maybe I make a calculated investment in something like that and then partake in it, obviously not to the level that a founder would. But I think we get pigeonholed, or I see this, where it kind of the only way to make money is work hard, sell an online course, or be in real estate. And all those three could be true, but there are always ways to make money or to invest or put, to put your toe in the water. I mean, what you're doing now, 10 years ago, you wouldn't, could you have imagined that you would be doing this kind of work and, and spending all of your time and energy and money focused on this? No, I actually thought that I was trapped in the in-home sales. I thought I was trapped. Wow. In the mortgage, I thought I was trapped. Now, I, I made good money. Don't get me wrong. Right. Money's important. You need money on this planet, but it's not everything. And I, you know, I'm, I'm like, truthfully, I got bored with the mortgage thing. I got bored with it. Like, it's not, I just think that some people were, were put on this planet and you, and you go into the wrong thing that, that it's below your potential for what you can accomplish or your interest level. And then, but then you feel trapped and it's not a life to live. And I felt like that for a while. And then finally, I made the move to like, understand, like, I need to figure something out. I got to, there's a got to be a bigger game I can play. Right. And that, then that's what motivated you to make the move. Oh, that's fantastic. So now when people reach out to you now, are you uh, say you do do some coaching, but really that's not what you focus on very much. Is it? No, I could build a coaching business, but at the end of the day, I'd rather take the time and coach tech co-founders with, with my partners and Mm -hmm. be an influence for that. And mm-hmm. spend my time doing that and my mortgage business rather than, you know, I do have, I do have a couple of clients, but I only right. do it because they're easy as far as they're not a pain in the ass. They listen to what I'm talking about and doing, and it's just Isn't not that a, something it's not a fight. Yeah. I don't want right. to, I don't want to, I, I can't deal with the people that just don't want to listen and, and just not, not, not worth my time. I don't care how much money. So, right. Right. My husband says he's the most coachable athlete in the room. And I think that's key. You can hire a coach, but if you aren't coachable, forget it. Yeah. Like there's no point. It's a waste of your time and their time. And yep. a good and a good coach won't take your money because they don't care. They've got other, you know, fish to fry. So how can people keep up with you, learn about what it is that you're doing? What can we expect to see in the future? So the new app that we have coming out, uh, we're launching this week to get our creators into it. It's called Blueprinted and it's spelled differently than the color blue. It's B-L-O-O printed. And if you go to blueprinted.com, and you will find all the information you need on this. But if you could just think of a marketplace, I don't want to say the name on this, this show, but there's a big marketplace where you can go and you can buy anything and they'll deliver it to your house, right? And if you could think of that, but as a, a place you go for success blueprints, like anything that you want to accomplish, you want to become a real estate investor, you want to become a podcast, you want to write a book, you want to parent better. There's going to be experts in blueprinted that are going to put their step-by-step process to their success in this app. Now, it's not like a digital training platform, like we're digital videos. Okay. That's, that's good and all. We love those. But at the end of the day, you know, it's a lot of like theory and over your head kind of things a lot of times. And then when you're done with it, you're like, even if you complete it, you're like, what's the next step? Like, what do I do next? I don't know. I, I don't know where to go. This is something that says, okay, look, step one, do this. Step two, this. Now on step three, you might run into this. If it, this happens, you know, you're, you're going to want to switch it up and do this now. And then, and in step four, some people are going to get discouraging with you. They're going to question what you're doing. They're going to laugh at you. Don't listen to them. Use it as fuel. Keep going. It's normal for that to happen. They're just talking about themselves. There's going to be encouragement in there, but also step-by-step step, how to accomplish something all the way through um, with a built-in accountability feature. I mean, it's just it's exciting, man. I, I'm fired up. So blueprinted.com is the best place to go to check that out and find me on anywhere, man. Like if you uh, Clubhouse, Instagram, Mikey C Rock, I'm everywhere. I so. see you on Clubhouse <laughs> all the time. I see notifications on Clubhouse all the time. I love that idea of blueprinted because you think about it. Like if I wanted to get started in real estate, where do I start? Well, I Google it and then I've got 18 million different. And then you got to choose somebody 
whose blueprint you might try to follow. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but do yeah. they really look like that? But there is some, you know, really basic steps in in anything. So that is such a great idea. It's really a repository for all of that. How do you do anything? I love that idea. That's so great. Yeah. I mean, if you could just think of uh, the top New York Times bestseller list. And if I, which I'm doing, and my, my team is phenomenal at getting this stuff. There's a guy named Eric that works with us that's just phenomenal at getting information and getting people's contact numbers and things. But when we go after all the best-selling authors, New York Times, they, and that nonfiction, they mm-hmm. should all have a blueprint right? that goes along with their book. And people can go in there and they can follow step-by-step of what they should be doing with their life if they want to achieve something. So there's so much, I mean, I, I can't even cover the potential with this, this product. Oh, that's so exciting. So is it launched? at this time? So right now we're just tomorrow, we're going to be having, I think we should be by tomorrow, the creators will be able to go in and purchase a package and then have us help them build a blueprint with their content. And so what we have to do, it's like the chicken before the egg, I guess, or the egg before the chicken, one or the other, but (laughs) we have to get creators in there to put blueprints in there for them to be able to market, to be able to get the public in there. Right. And what's different about this than a, than a course as well is usually a course, people are just marketing their own courses out there. We're going to actually have a marketplace where public can go and search topics and keywords and find different people. And right. so it's a new way to get found out as well. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I love your story. And I'm, I, I still think back on that story you told about being a little boy and I, that makes me sad. But the fact that you turn it into rocket fuel is amazing and that you now have a new generation in your own family that you can teach better things. So that's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. I appreciate it. I mean, gratitude's a big deal to me. And I just, I'm thankful that people are actually wanting me to have, be on their show and then the the audience showing up, you know, thank you so much guys. Yes. I appreciate it. Take care. Well, that's it for this week of the Micro Empires podcast. I hope you will join us again next time. And please be sure to subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts. And join us on the Micro Empires community on Facebook. I'd love to see you there. I do a Facebook Live on Friday mornings, and I'd love to hear your questions. Of course, reach out to me on all the socials. Send me an email. Snap a screenshot on your phone and post it. I love hearing from you, so keep it coming. Thanks, guys. 